that at that time, you being Gentiles in the flesh, separated from a Jew, is because back at that time we were without Christ. So then when we receive Christ, there's a difference. Keep reading. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Ah, so it's like today, that term alien. It's not referring to weird creatures from outer space. All right? The term alien is referring that you're not part of this country. From the commonwealth of Israel. Israel's commonwealth. Their prosperity, their success, and strangers from the covenants of promise. We Gentiles were strangers from God's promise and covenant that He gave to Israel. Having no hope and without God in the world. That's a perfect description of you, yes? You are without hope and you are without God in this world. So then that means that, verse 12, this happened when we were without Christ. So when we were without Christ, before when we were lost in sin, so let's put over here, before and after. So after you had two natures, right? The purple one is your old nature, the blue one is your new nature. Over here, before, this is your completely your old nature. So in this old nature, what were you? You were not you were separated from Jewish promises. Based off of without Christ. So then that means when you're with Christ, when you're in Jesus Christ, then that means you do have access to the Jewish promises. That's a huge blessing, is it not? Where God says, my chosen people are the Jews, you are now God's chosen people. That's a huge blessing. Now, there's another heresy to avoid. See, in Pauline epistles, you have to address so many heresies. Because this is church-age doctrine that Satan really wants to attack. So the heresy to avoid is replacement theology. A lot of Calvinists hate that term, so they give their uh, weird little semantic terms, which I'm not going to even give, because they don't deserve that. So the Calvinists and the people who believe in replacement theology, they believe that the nation of Israel is done away with, and God replaced the nation of Israel with the church. So basically the church is basically the real Jew, they say. And the fake Jews are the ones who are supposed to be real Jews by ethnicity. <laughs> that they, they, they consider those to be fake Jews. They use this text as proof that basically, see, you have access to the Jewish promises, so you become the real Jews, and then the physical fleshly Jews, they're not the real Jews. Well, that's baloney. The reason why it's baloney is because if you read verse 12, this is all based on a spiritual... These are all a spiritual transaction. This is not physical. This is not earthly. This is spiritual. Now, if people deny that, then are you going to deny the context of verse 10, that this is a spiritual transaction? Are you going to deny the context of verse 1, which is a spiritual transaction? Are you going to deny the, uh, the parts of verse 4, 5, 6, and 7, that what Christ did for you, death, burial, resurrection, that when you shared in that, that that's not a spiritual transaction? Verse 6, you're up in heaven right now. Is it you think that's physical or that's a spiritual transaction? So see, this is all spiritual transaction. So the simple answer to, to verse 12 is, yes, you have access to Jewish promises, but it's spiritually. Oh no, it's earthly, it's physical. No, I'll give you proof, all right? The easiest proof is God said that he would uh, reward the Jew on earth, physical prosperity, if they actually serve him and forsake their idols. Now, how many of you are rich millionaires right now? No one is. When you're serving God, obviously we go through suffering, unfairness, and poverty. And Paul, Pauline epistle says persecution. If you live godly, you suffer 
persecution. You don't become prosperous. You don't conquer your enemies by the sword and shed blood. That was Israel's promise. Israel's kingdom and promise is earthly and physical, fleshly. Why? Because simply they're a physical, earthly nation and people of God. By ethnicity, Jew. But us, we're spiritually. Spiritually, we have access to the spiritual kingdom of God. The spiritual promises that He's given to us. Salvation through His Son. Rewards are spiritual. That's why we get it up in heaven. And that's why we're the spiritual people of God. And that's why we're spiritual Jews. We are not physical earthly Jews. We are spiritual Jews. All right, let's go back over here. Verse 13. Verse 13. So, all of, so we're spiritual Jews. That's a huge blessing. Yeah. You and I are spiritual Jews. Amen. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus. See, distinguishing verse 12. Now, right? After. This is now. Now when you're based off of what? In Christ, right? i got to put this condition here or some Calvinists are going to get a heart attack. And they need to see this, okay? This is without Christ. All of this is not forced against your free will. This is based off of the condition in Christ. So once we're in Christ, we become this. See that? We have access to this. But before, without Christ, we had no access to this. Now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, yeah, no kidding, there were some times that you were just far away that there was no way God could have saved your soul. How many of you have felt like that you had a lost loved one or even your own life that you seem to be like a hopeless cause? Sometimes you seem so far away. But then what did God do? Are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You were far away. God put you near. God put you near because it's all done through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter how far away you are. You're never far away. The blood of Jesus Christ will bring you close. So notice that the cross was over here during the time of the A.D.s, your main nigh. It's not before the foundation of the world that the B.C. is over here, all right? If there should be some kind of T mark, it should be this. This is incorrect, all right? The other way around would be this way correctly, all right? Going back at this verse, we're main nigh by the blood of Christ. Now, some modern Bibles... They would put that as death of Christ instead of blood of Christ. Wicked. Going back to Ephesians 1.7, I told you some modern versions, they would get rid of the phrase through His blood. So in Ephesians 1.7, some, some modern versions they'll change that, but it's official when you go to Colossians 1. When they took that, that same verse of Ephesians 1.7 is repeated at Colossians and that's where it becomes more plain. When you look at modern Bible versions, they take out the phrase through His blood. Even though they'll leave it for Ephesians 1.7. But some of them will uh, change words with it. But this is scary, is that if, Ephes if Ephesians 2.13, they change the blood of Christ to the death of Christ, it makes so much sense why John MacArthur, that he denies the importance, the significance of the blood of Christ. He says it's only the death of Christ. It's only the death of Christ. Well, isn't the blood specifically important? No, it's the death over. The blood was a part of it, so it's the death overall. The thing is this, the reason why, yes, we believe the death is important, but something specific as well is important, and that has to be his blood. It has to be. It has to be. Because through it's in according to this verse, we're made nigh. But it becomes much more real than this. If you literally believe the blood is that important, that it's real, it's God's blood. It's not just some kind of human blood you spill on the ground and then it goes away, nothing significant and important. It's just the act of death itself. The act of spilling the blood is important. No, it's that blood substance that is important. The actual blood. You might say, why? Go to the book of 1 John 5, 8. And then uh, keep your hand in Ephesians 2. I'm going to show you something here. That blood is so important that right now, your salvation is hanging. Your spiritual closeness with God is hanging by the blood. Amen. 
Remember that teaching I gave on prayer? What was important? The blood of Christ was important for, that pow for, for the prayer to become even power more powerful. So we believe blood is absolutely important. Otherwise, your spiritual operation right now, your spiritual effectiveness, your salvation, that close access with God would be broken. All right, so let me explain it over here. Going back to Ephesians, keep your hand at 1 John 5, go to Ephesians 2, verse 18. Look at this. For through him, we both have access by what? One spirit. One spirit. Did you read that? Okay. We have access through the spirit. So look at this. Okay, let me try to write this down to make it simpler. This is known as access here. But the verse says through the Spirit, right? So we believe that it's through the Spirit. Let's say it's not blood for now. Let's say Spirit. Could we say blood is in the context of Ephesians 2? Yes. The reason why you can put this as close access communication with the Spirit in the same line with the blood is because based off of verse of context, verse 13, it's swallowing the context of 13. And 13 says nigh. See that? That's the same thing there. Nigh as access. And then blood over here, spirit. Well, I don't believe you. No, th these share one witness. Go to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. They're the same witness. See, this is your evidence. Your evidence. Without blood, there's no evidence. That's extremely important. Go to the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth. The spirit, the water, and the what? Blood. Now, look. Witness in where? Earth. It's still, see that? It's still in operation right now, the blood. It's still in operation on the earth. I mean, isn't the spirit in operation on the earth? Yes or no? Yes, according to 1 John 5a, right? He's still in operation on the earth. So then you have to put the blood there, unless you like to pick and choose, because Calvinists tend to do that, unfortunately. They like to pick words and verses that suit their biased doctrine. But no, be honest and leave the verse as it says. Follow context. By context, there is no doubt. Spirit access is the same thing with blood being nigh. Why? They share the same witness. So that's why we are made nigh by the blood of Christ is more literal than you think. It's more literal than you think may not be fleshly physical but it is more literal than you think because literally that blood is what keeps uh, you and heaven close keeps prayer real and powerful access all right let's go back to the book of ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14 for he is our peace so speaking of jesus christ he is our peace the context is what gen uh He's talking about all of us, our peace, who hath made both one. Who's the both? Remember the context of verse uh, 11 is Jew and Gentile. So he made Jew and Gentile one together and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So between us and the Jew over here, the Bible shows that there was a middle wall that blocked Jew and Gentile. Now this wall is known, notice this is middle wall of partition. What is partition? Partition means dividing into parts. So see, this is definitely dividing us in parts over here. But God, what did he do? He broke it down. I'll tell you what's greater than the Berlin Wall coming down. It was this wall. That is the most significant change ever in history. When this wall, God broke down this middle wall of partition, the Bible says that He hath made both one. Both one. All right, let's look at the next verses. Let's look at the next verses over here. The Bible says, Having abolished in His flesh... So Jesus Christ abolished something in His flesh. Abolish means to wipe out. In His body. The what? 
enmity. Enmity means like a strong opposition. So there is a strong opposition here between the Jew and Gentile. But Jesus Christ abolished in his body what? The enmity. What is this enmity that's strongly opposed to us? Now show this to your Seventh-day Adventist friend. The law of Moses is still so significant and important we have to practice it. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. The commandments are in ordinances. Ordinances are known as rules. So it's the same thing as law of commandments. So the law of Moses, Jesus Christ abolished that in his flesh. Why? When he died on the cross then. So when he died on the cross, he got rid of that law of Moses. For to, why? For to make in himself, so in Christ, see this is all based in Christ. So in him, he was trying to make what? It, based in him, make of twain one new man so he was trying to make both parties into one and it says one new man remember this is what the new nature remember that that's why you can't deny this this is a, the whole context is spiritual nature spiritual nature all of ephesians 2 is the context of spiritual nature 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 new 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 don't eradicate the new nature. Don't be a heretic and eradicate it. Don't be a replacement theology and think that, oh, I'm a real Jew and ignore the spiritual context, the spiritual nature behind it. Let's keep reading over here. So, twain, what does that mean? Twain means basically two different parts over here. So these two, uh, these two parts, or two, he, he turns it into one. So Jew and Gentile become one. So when you're saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, God does not see you spiritually as Jew, Gentile, or Korean, or Chinese, or uh, Irish, or Russian. He sees everybody as one. Yeah. Why? Because that is spiritual. Yeah. In this spiritual lens, He sees everybody as one based off of what? In Christ. There is no difference. Absolutely no difference at all. Amen. Beware of some of these. Uh, there's another extreme. Beware of these uh, people who are infatuated with Jewish ordinances and try to get you back. That's what verse 15 is warning you about. It doesn't give that much significance. Going back to the Jewish law, ordinances, keep the Sabbath. You know, you get better watch out for some of these guys. These guys who are into like the Hebrew roots and people getting into Messianic Judaism and et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these people, and Seventh-day Adventists, they're very guilty in trying to get you back into Jewish ordinances. Like it's some very big special thing. But to God, He sees nothing as very special. He sees that as simply a custom. So a Korean custom is no greater than a Jewish custom, I'm sorry. An American custom is no greater than a Jewish custom. Shocking. I understand that. Don't have this Jewish elitism mentality. You've got to watch out for that attitude. Because why? Spiritually, God sees them both as one. He don't see anyone as somebody more important, more special. All right, let's look at verse 16. Verse 16. Uh, uh, the last part of verse 15 says, So making peace. So all of this is done where he makes two different parties into one because it accomplishes peace at the end. It's all a peaceful process. No more war and bickering. Yes. Look at verse 16. And that he might reconcile both unto God. So God, reconcile, what does that mean? Two uh, different parties who are in opposition and he makes them into one. He makes them meet, have a treaty, have peace into one. He reconciles Jew and Gentile both unto God, brings them into God, Based off of what? In what? One body by the cross. See that? Based on the cross, he makes them one body, Jew and Gentile. Some hyper-dispensationalists teach the body of Christ started somewhere at the book of Ephesians, which is nonsense because it says by the cross. At the cross he started it. Some will put at the middle of Acts or at Acts 28. That's baloney. He did it by the cross he made them. One body of Jesus Christ where there's no distinction of Jew and Gentile. He made that happen by the cross of Calvary. 
having slain the enmity thereby. Seventh-day Adventism is slain, is dead. <gasps> I just lost subscribers. I just got angry comments and dislikes just now. So, slain the enmity thereby. So, so this, the cross of Jesus Christ, slew the enmity. God called the law of ordinances, law of Moses, enmity. Why? Because it, it, may, it caused a difference. It caused a split. Some people would say, some Seventh-day Adventists would say, Jesus Christ said, I came not to break the law, to, but to fulfill it. But see, that's the simple answer. He fulfilled the law through his death. Because he kept the law. He was a Jew of the Jews. He kept the law of Moses, and he fulfilled it. But he, after he fulfilled it, he put it to death through his cross. See, why? Because he fulfilled it for our sin, because we cannot fulfill the law of Moses. So Jesus fulfilled the law for us so that we don't have to build up our righteousness. We can receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ.